Have you ever met one of those people who just can't be stopped? It's like they're unstoppable. Yeah, I have. Me too. What's their mystique? Nothing stops these people. Don't stop. Welcome to Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso. You're about to meet some of the most amazing people. They've accomplished their goals despite insurmountable odds. They beat adversity, physical hardship, and traumatic events, and emerge triumphantly. They're people just like you and me, and they're winners. Are you unstoppable? Here's Frankie to show you how. Well, hello there, and welcome to Mission Unstoppable. It's great to have you back again. Our guest today is a gentleman who is a wonderful guide. You can't believe where we're going today. Mark Saxemeyer is the president, CEO, and executive director of the nonprofit journalistic production house called The Reporters, Inc. He, along with his colleagues, are on a mission to create social awareness, encourage social change, and champion social justice through powerful multimedia storytelling. Mark has always wanted to be a journalist. He started his own newspaper at the age of 10, and his passion for truth has never waned. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a journalism degree. He went on to report and produce television segments for ABC, Fox, and CBS affiliates. He has been honored many times for his outstanding work, including 32 regional Emmy Awards, 17 regional Associated Press Awards, and 17 regional Society of Professional Journalistic Awards. Mark believes in volunteerism. He's mentored over 100 journalism students through his internship program. He's been a big brother, and as well as he has assisted high school, uh, he he is an assistant high school speech coach. He's well-respected in some of the more prestigious awards he has won, include an Emmy from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, the Edward R. Murrow from the Radio Television Digital News Association. He's also won national prizes from the Scripps Howard Foundation and the National Association of Black Journalists. Mark received the Leadership in Journalism Education Award from Loyola University in Chicago. He was presented the Young Alumni Award for Outstanding Achievement and Distinguished Service from UW-Wisconsin-Madison. And we will have to ask him in a moment, but I wonder if being the inaugural inductee into his high school's Hall of Fame, which is the Thomas Jefferson in Bloomington, might have meant the most. Who knows? Welcome, Mark. Hey, Frankie, how are you? Oh, doing really well. What an honor. I mean, look at all the honors, really. So how did Oh, it you know, all those will get you a loaf of bread and <laughs> some butter when you put them on the shelf. I know, but it feels good. Right. It's well, you know, <laughs> I guess it does. But I don't like to live in the past. I focus on the, the, the present. Okay. Well, I'm going to live in the past for a moment because I think that you're doing some profound and, and groundbreaking work. I really do. And well, I'm beyond impressed. And, you know, you are living out my dream because that's what I always wanted to do. And, you know, really? I went to school for photojournalism and mm. I don't know, I came back to Canada and just got totally sidetracked. But <laughs> as do many do, people in life. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, the show is meant to inspire others. And so, um, just seeing how unstoppable you have been in obtaining your dream is is incredible. Um, I want to go back and visit ten year old Mark, the one okay. who, you know, started the Drew Tribune. What was it like yeah. on Drew Avenue in Minnesota? Right. Yeah, well, that was that was uh, an odd little child, really, if you think about it. But uh, that was that's what I like to do. So I just thought it would be fun to uh, create my own newspaper and. Uh, Went door to door, asked everybody for their news. As you can imagine, some people weren't really interested in sharing their news with the neighbors. <laughs> um, and I learned quickly if someone was on vacation, you shouldn't actually put that in the paper because, mm-hmm. you know, then burglars would be alerted to their absence. My mom would um, mimeograph it on the on a Xerox machine at, uh, at her school uh, where she taught, and then I would uh, sell it for a nickel. Um, oh, how cute. So, oh yeah, gosh, so that so was the, the, the beginnings of it. Did you have to pay for the paper with your nickels, or did you get to keep them all? <laughs> I kept, I did keep the money, yes. The only the only costs were the distribution costs that Mom uh, was willing to pocket herself. So, yeah, but it was fun. And then we uh, we moved uh, to the Scarborough townhouses, so the paper went from the Drew Tribune to the Scarborough Scoop. Um, uh-huh. And that was also extraordinarily successful for me. 
That is so funny. I love that. <laughs> you lived abroad in Spain and Paraguay. What I did. did that? Yeah, when did yeah. you go there? When did you um, well, in, in Paraguay in the high school as an AFS, American Field Service foreign exchange mm-hmm. student, and uh, that's a fantastic place. Most people don't know anything about it. It's the uh, one of two landlocked countries in South America. You know, it's fairly poor. It had a military dictatorship at the time I was there, but I had lived with a fantastic family and really had a, just an awesome experience, and I'm still in touch with all of them. And my host, host family's brother now has kids, um, so I'm in touch with all of them. Um, and then in college I studied a year abroad in Spain. So my focus was trying to improve Spanish, my Spanish, um, so since I started now? learning. Uh, you know, I'm, I can I can converse fairly well, and, and as a journalist, it comes in handy if you're if you're uh, you know interviewing folks who don't speak English. So I can I can uh, utilize it for that purpose. Where did you get your your passion? Let's say for social impact. Where did that come from? Was your family into volunteering or? Mm, no, I would say. I would say that as a TV journalist, which I was for a quarter century, um, most of the stories that uh, intrigued me the most or I felt uh, added significance to the narrative of uh, our audience, to the culture, to society, had something to do with social issues, social justice. Um, So those were things that I gravitated towards as much as I could. You know, I'm not a reporter who loves to bang on doors and find out, you know, from the neighbors what happened to the guy who got murdered down the street. Those are mm-hmm. some people thrive on that kind of adrenaline. I never did and I never will. For me, I, I like to take a look at issues um, with a little time and space and give them meaning. And unfortunately, in TV news, there's not a lot of opportunity for that, especially now these days since, um, you know, the, the journalism universe is so fragmented. So um, when I ended that part of my career, what I really wanted to do was, uh, in a sense, return to the kinds of things I did as a kid when I, when I ran my own stuff, when I was the boss. And, you know, you can't really do that unless you're head of a huge TV news network or a a, a newspaper. So what I finally decided was, you know, I would pursue the kind of stories I did through a nonprofit type enterprise. And the audience for that would come. The people who were interested in this type of thing would be there. And, you know, I'll never be as rich as I might have been in the past or could have been had I followed Mm -hmm. another avenue. But... You know, when you're doing work you believe in and work that that kind of um, excites you every day and makes you want to do journalism as opposed to dread going to your job and fearing you're going to have to go knock on the door of a dead person's relative's brother's sister to get a picture of them to put on the news. Um, You know, it's it's life changing. Well, they're totally different careers, really. Yeah, (laughs) aren't they? Aren't they? But you know, it's interesting that that it's a nonprofit. And it's interesting that even though it is a nonprofit and, like you said, you're not getting paid um, the big bucks that you might have been paid, uh, you are still being recognized. Like you're still making an impact with your peers and, you know, with those you know, who see the work that you do. So that, that's pretty significant. Well, you, you know, you know, with your show, too, you know, you can make an impact now without – having to go a more traditional old school route that, that that happened before the advent of the internet. So we we got nonprofit status for this in two thousand five for the Reporters Inc. We were one of the first journalistic entities to get a nonprofit status and it was difficult. It was a lot of a lot of work. I imagine. Um but I, I saw the writing on the wall when it came to where traditional media was going and I really wanted to to create something um, that that could do the kind of work we're doing and also be funded. And and I was applying for grants, and most people were saying, well, unless you have that nonprofit status, we can't give you a grant. So, um, so yeah, so that's 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 where it's taken me. And and as I said a second ago, you know, I I really do believe that that if you you know stick to your guns and produce work and follow a path that brings you meaning uh, other mm-hmm. people will connect to that i mean they connect to they connect to honesty and transparency and legitimacy and they connect to people's hearts so if you're doing work um that that connects with them in that way i mean you're, you 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 will succeed well i said that you know it was profound work and and i do believe that it is uh, let's talk about uh how the reporters inc got started like where did everybody come from how Let's start there. I know that, that you know you want to work for yourself and everything, but the idea of 
okay, I'm going to set up the shop and we're going to call it the Reporters Inc. And we started a nonprofit. Now, where did the other people come to? Come well, to the, the, the way it evolved was um, I had done uh, a couple documentaries when I worked with Fox Chicago um, that had major social impact um, dealing with race relations and gay-straight relations. Okay. And when we did the, 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 the race relations project, we did a multi-part series, then we produced a documentary, and it aired on, on Fox stations. Um, but by the time we finished the gay straight one, there was some resistance to turn that into a documentary and air it. And um, I found that very odd. I didn't know what was going on at Fox at the time, but I thought, why wouldn't you air this? They did allow me to make a documentary and enter it into film festivals, which is also a little odd looking back. But we did. And from that experience, I really, that was where I first realized, wow, there's such an audience for these things in a, in a outside of the medium I'm used to. So um, we were invited to play this particular documentary. It's called Amer um, Experiment Gay and Straight in, in a film festival in South Africa. And so when we went to South Africa, and when I say we, it was a partner I worked with at Fox at that time, um, we thought, you know, you know what would be great is to really um, delve into South Africa's um, race relations uh, 10, 12 years after apartheid. So we started filming the documentary there. We got back. We were really excited about it. Um, we we, we self-funded it, essentially, and Fox didn't want to air that either. So at that point, I just began thinking, like, what am I doing? Like, what, why am I... Why am I a cog in a big wheel mm -hmm. um, when I can be, you know, driving the wheel myself? Um, so that's really where it started. So um, when you got it, when you get everybody on board, if you look at our board and our advisory committee, I mean, these are made up of um, journalists and other people in a wide swath of professions, most of whom I have worked with before or I know personally who believe not only in me but believe in this particular cause. So, okay, I'm going to um, stop you know, right there because we're going to go to a commercial break in just oh, a moment. Okay. You have been listening to, to Mark Saxenmeyer. He is with reportersinc.org and, and we will be coming back because there's so much to talk about. So please don't go anywhere. And when Mark comes back, um, we're going to talk about some of his projects that that they've been that they have done. I definitely want to talk about in depth the black the experiment in black and white and experiment gay straight. Don't go anywhere. Coming right back. Don't stop. That's right. Don't stop listening. Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso will continue right after these messages. Stop. If you could live your life truly standing in a place of peace, joy, and abundance, wouldn't that make your heart soar? Now you can with Lessons in Joyful Living with your host, Kimberly Rinaldi. Mondays at noon central, Kimberly Rinaldi, having created a highly successful coaching practice, now teaches Lessons in Joyful Living. She believes in empowering others and that through it, you have the ability to break through any and all barriers, thus allowing you to reach your greatest potential and joyfully step into your life's purpose. What used to take weeks, months, or even years, she can now teach you in a matter of hours with her programs. For more on Kim and her show, go to her website, KimberlyRinaldi.com. That's R-I-N-A-L-D-I.com. Then join us for Lessons in Joyful Living with your host, Kimberly Rinaldi. It's words you never heard. Believe it or not, there are times when even I can't think of the right word. The inability to think of a word is called lethologica. Texas Monthly Magazine recently came out with some colorful homespun sayings, old as dirt and common as cornbread in the Lone Star State. Did you hear about the Texan that could strut sitting down? But he was all hat and no cattle, which means very boastful, but with nothing about which to boast. On top of that, he don't know a widget from a wangdoodle or a diddly squat. His wife was a mighty strong woman. She'd charge hell with a bucket of ice water. She was always telling folks that he was so tight, he could squeeze a nickel till the buffalo screamed. She also said he was famous for calling the hogs all night. Or snoring. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my new app, Too Funny for Words. And we're back. You're listening to Mission Unstoppable. I am your host, Frankie Picasso, and my guest today is Mark Saxemeyer, and he is one of the reporters. 
<laughs> Mark, you have some amazing, you know, we, we, you touched on experiment in black and white. And I mean, you did win an award from a black association. Like, that's pretty incredible. And we talked about, uh, you, you also touched on experiment gay and straight and going to uh, South Africa. And that was your reaching for the rainbow, I believe. Um, right. Did that, did that, was that ever fully? No, what we did, we didn't finish that, and that's actually uh, on the back burner right now. But the goal is to return and uh, re-interview the people we interviewed in 2004. So we're going to show kind of an evolution of their thought processes over time. Um, so we've changed it from more of a contemporary documentary to a historical one. Um, but uh, we've stayed in touch with the folks we've interviewed. So the goal is to actually kind of um, you know show not only how they've aged physically, but sh- uh, show how their mindset has or has not changed. And you were also showing the difference between South African blacks and American blacks. Is that? Yeah, I mean that's a component of it. Um, you know, it's 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 multi layered. Um, right. But if you've ever been to South Africa and spent time. Um, you know, not just as a tourist, but kind of as someone who's immersed in the culture, you you see a lot of parallels between their civil rights movement and ours. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of similarities, but um, at the same time, um, there's some distinct differences. So we were going to try to point out that. Um, it, but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's a it's an interesting subject to delve into because they all speak English, which mm-hmm. makes it a lot easier than it say it would be in a culture where the language was different. Um, so uh, you know, there's still a lot of uh, deeply um, rooted racism amongst white people in South Africa. And uh, what was interesting, I was working with a black reporter there, and we would do a joint interview with the white person. And then after the interview, um, the white people would pull me aside to clarify what they meant um, with me only, as if I, as a fellow white person, would only understand. It was um, pretty astounding, really. Yeah, you know it is interesting. I, I just I, I'm working on a book right now with with a, 21 women and and a number of them are black and and they're writing you know they're they're bearing their chest and and you know they wrote about how they really thought all white people hated them and how they hated all white people and there was no understanding and they never thought mm. that they could come to terms and yet they they finally came to a place in their life where they realized that that's not true. Yeah, they don't all hate them and. They don't have to hate all of them either. It's, yeah. it's interesting. And so when I watched your experiment in black and white, that was very interesting because it kind of, you know, and, and even in, in gay and straight, you come to when you, when, like, let's, okay, let's talk about what you did. You may as well explain the, the experiment. Okay. You brought um, to the home. Well, the, the, the experiment in black and white kind of grew out of uh, a thought I had that, that, Black and white Americans, um, especially in, in um, communities like Chicago, where, where it's a very segregated city, um, where I was living at the time, really don't like to talk with each other about their perceptions of one another. And if you do, you run the risk of being called a racist or being politically incorrect or creating uh, workplace drama or a situation that could get out of hand, so instead people avoid it. So at that time, when we... Um, we're thinking of ideas how to address it. Um, it's when the real world, uh, you know, the show on MTV and Survivor and this kind of uh, reality TV based. Um, programming was taking off and I was always a fan of those shows especially the real world um, and I thought you know it would be great if we could turn this into something journalistic if we could we could um, sequester folks um, like they do on these shows um, but actually do it for good turn it into something sociological and and not entertainment but actually has meaning and there was a debate like why would you sequester folks um, and I, uh, my thought was well when they go home you know they can complain and bitch to their family members about what what happened that day but if we keep them all together for a week like summer camp um, you know people there's really nowhere to run and nowhere to hide and you have to address all those issues um, and you can't be politically correct the whole time so that was the kind of inherent beauty of the project because you see people really really getting to the root of why they believe what they believe really addressing their biases and their prejudices and their issues and um, there's just a lot of evolution in it um, as as just the kind of conductor of the project at the time, I was very eye-opening for me, and and really it was a week of nonstop taping, you know, with cameras rolling 24/7, capturing everything. It was a lot to transcribe and log to create the series and the documentary. But you know, it turned out even better than I could have ever expected. It was a um, kind of a 
uh, just for me, uh, um, a huge point in my career, in my life, where I realized what the medium of television and filmmaking can do and how I really had to push forth in that direction because otherwise I'd do, it would just be wasting my time. So that, that was kind of the gist of it. And if you watch it, you'll, you know, you'll see the discussions that are, that are um, really uh, delved into everything from reparations to driving while black, shopping while black, um, stereotypes, the way people act in certain situations, discrimination, affirmative action. Um, so, I mean, um, you know, I'm very proud of it to this can day. Can anybody go um, to Vimeo and watch these? Yes, you can. We, okay. There's clips of, uh, like, six six clips, which, um, you know, they're, uh, yeah, they're on Vimeo. Um, and uh, if you just type in experiment in black and white, you'll find them. Um, the reporters are just launching a new YouTube channel, and they're on there as well. Um, but we have, we're just almost now that, done. Was that 2001, Mark? That was 2001, correct, yes. Okay. And, and, now, and the reporters is a, hoping to actually a remake it for a new audience, so we're excited about that. 2016. Yeah, well, hopefully, yeah. hopefully. I mean, again, you know, everything we do is dependent on fundraising. Right, right. So how can people help if they want to? Um, well, you know, if they're interested in, in seeing more about what we, what we do, you can go to the, the website. That's pretty uh, comprehensive and up, always updated. Um, uh, look at what we're up to, uh, everything from the documentaries to the long-form journalism we put online. And that's at thereporters.org, easy enough, thereporters.org. And there's a, there's a page to donate as well. And, you know, if people have questions, we're um, always willing to talk to them on the phone or email because um, we'd love to share what we're up to and, and uh, you know, and if they want to get involved in other ways um we welcome that as well so how were how were they um chosen how did you choose or were they just volunteers or did you have criteria for in the experiment black and white, black and white? Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was an interview process um there was probably like 900 people i think who wow. applied and um and, and it was a lengthy written um um, kind of questionnaire, and then from that we narrowed that down into in- interviews in person. You know, we were looking for people who uh, really had some strong opinions they wanted to share, but came from a place of intelligence and um, uh, kind of an experience level. Uh, so they what what they said uh, had depth and meaning, but but again, also from different point parts of uh, the Chicago area, which is where we did it. Um, you know, five white, five black, five women five men um, the ages range from early 20s to early 50s or late 50s so you know it was, it was a, a very interesting group of people and sometimes just you you luck out and I think there was a lot of serendipity there that uh, the people we ended up with um, really gelled in a way that so many issues came out so um, so not only interestingly, but effectively in terms of, like, getting people to really think about why they, they personally thought the way they did, where their, their thought processes come, came from, whether it be their culture, their environment, their neighborhood, their parents, um, and, uh, you know, just allowed the people who participated and the viewers to step back and really analyze for themselves where their thoughts on race evolved from and, and where they wanted to go with them. Mm-hmm. So interesting. The when okay, so experiment in gay and straight that came after black and white, and you thought, wow, that that worked out so well. Let's try exactly. Let's try it was kind of a again. sequel, little sequel, or using the same kind of reality TV format, five gay, five straight, but but taking a look at some of the issues that divide um, uh, gays and straights, um, and that one ended up being a little bit different in the sense that. You know, most people who have an issue with homosexuality, a lot of it is rooted in religion. And, um, you know, when you're talking about religion, people don't really budge because they have faith and belief systems that either you, you, you agree with or you don't. So, um, that was a, that turned out to be a little different than I thought because a lot of the discussions and the debates focused on that. Um, but, you know, also a lot of the same issues uh, that are still um, part of our culture today and part of our dialogue were in that one because this was 2002 or three, um, having to do with, you know, acceptance of a gay child, gay bashing, um, discrimination, um, is it a choice, um, relationships, same-sex relationships re- uh, related to uh, d- uh, adoption, having a child, um, you know, what what you would do if your child were gay, how you would feel, um, uh, yeah, uh, all kinds. 
that was very powerful. And it was so interesting to see, you know, maybe seven days is something magical. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> it feels I, I, like a hundred when you're when you're in the middle of it. Pardon? It feels like a long time when you're yeah, in the I'm middle sure of it. Yeah, I'm sure it feels like a, like a long time when you're in the middle of it. But you know, um, I, I, I sat shiva for seven days, and it just seemed like like you know, at the beginning you're all upset and everybody's your tensions are high, and then by the mm-hmm. end of it, it's like it's like a magic thing happens and and you go through the whole process up and down and then you walk out mm-hmm. calm again and and so with some revelation and and i think that everybody that was part of that probably including you and and your partner there mm-hmm. uh, had 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 some revelations that maybe they weren't expecting to have at the end yeah like, well there was really a lot of doubt going into these where change their mind what yeah what are you really going to accomplish in seven days but yeah. i go back to this idea of again when people are forced to live together not just sit down at a table and discuss an issue like at a meeting but when they're forced to live together to to cook and to clean and to do all the things that, that a household does like a family there's a, a connective tissue that develops and it develops rather quickly um and as a result of that people tend to share and then they tend to care because they, they've not only have they you know had to deal with an overflowing toilet with you um, and been able to, to work through that trauma and then um, and then laugh about it but then they see you in a different light so you can actually address issues that you otherwise wouldn't with people in, in a very more controlled uh, a setting um, and I also apply it to that summer camp you know we all go away to summer camp remember and you leave at the end of the week and you're like oh I've made these great new friends are going to be my friends for life. Well, they may not end up being your friends for life. You may not stay in touch with them forever, but you always will have that connective tissue of that week where you bonded in a way that you otherwise wouldn't have had it not been for that experience. So I know that all the participants in both those projects, they still, um, uh, many of them, not all of them, many of them are still connected um, via social media or even, um, you know, in, in real life. Uh, they meet, they, they hang out, they talk, they call. Um, so, you know, I, I know it's uh, it had an impact on them. How fascinating is that? And, and they stay in touch with you, too? Yeah, most of them, yeah. Very I mean, cool. you know, life is We're gonna such go to that you can't break, stay Mark. in touch I'm with sorry. everybody. But... <laughs> Okay. There's always that, you know, somebody has to pay the bills. But we That's are going to come right. back in just a moment. So don't go anywhere, folks. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about innocent convicts. We're going to talk about the queens, transgenders. And we're going to talk about a whole lot more. So don't go anywhere. Here we come. Picasso will continue right after these messages. Stop. Close your eyes and imagine living your life without limits. Where would you go? Who would you meet? What would you do? During an Uncover Your Hidden Genius session, you will discover what's keeping you from living your life with purpose, passion, and fulfillment of your potential. You'll get a clear vision of the steps you need to take to uncover your hidden genius so that you can live a life without limits. Sessions can be done over the phone, Skype, or in person. Find out more at www.JoyceBufordEmpowers.com or by calling 903-287-0747. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. If strengthening your muscles is your primary goal, is it better to do yoga or Pilates? The New York Times reported that the answer depends mainly on what you are trying to strengthen. Studies show that Pilates is an effective method to fortify the muscles of the abdominal wall. They question whether it strengthens the rest of the body, though. However, they state that yoga, with its fluid poses, may strengthen larger sections of the body. A study published in the Asian Journal of Sports Medicine found that after six months of almost daily yoga sun salutations and no other resistance training, the participants could bench press significantly more weight and complete more push-ups and pull-ups than at the beginning of the study. They state that yoga is the winner. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. Like us on Facebook at Fitness Minute with Annette Hammond. (laughs) 
and we're back. It's Mission Unstoppable. Thanks for not going anywhere. I am your host, Frankie Picasso. My guest today is Mark Saxenmeyer. He is from thereporters.org. And I promised we were going to talk about the innocent convicts. And that's something that Mark and his team is passionate about. And they have... Uh, they're doing a, they've done a documentary and let's talk about what has caused you guys to start with the innocent convict project. Uh, well, this one came to our attention by a young filmmaker in Texas, um, in the Lubbock area, it goes to Texas tech. He's a Nigerian immigrant. His name is Osaji Okuroa and he found us online and he's an inspiring filmmaker who also has a great interest in social causes and, um, since he goes to Texas Tech, he became aware of a story of a young man named Tim Cole who was wrongly convicted of raping a fellow student at Texas Tech in the 1980s. And um, Tim went to prison for this crime despite the fact that the actual rapist confessed. His um, confession was ignored by law enforcement and the criminal justice system. Um, Tim never... Um, gave up on his claim of innocence and his fight to be freed. Um, unfortunately, he died in prison of an asthma attack uh, before advanced DNA could definitively determine that the rape had been committed by the man who confessed and not Tim Cole. So Tim became the first um, posthumously exonerated person in the state of Texas, and he was pardoned by the governor, Rick Perry, um, a few years ago posthumously. Um, so anyway, Ossie uh, just thought, you know, this is a documentary, and he um, had started work on some of it, um, but really didn't have a foundation or a platform to make it work. So he reached out to us, and uh, you know, initially um, I thought, how are we going to make this work? Um, what are we going to do? But he was so passionate about it, and, and what I love about what we do is we literally give people that platform who have a voice, and I don't like to say they're voiceless, because they're definitely not voiceless, but they don't really know or have a way to take um, – their vision and turn it into something um, tangible. Mm -hmm. So we started working with him, and as a result, we said we thought, you know what, we should really expand this beyond the Tim Cole case and to, and look at some of the other wrong reasons uh, and causes uh, behind wrongful convictions. So we've expanded it to seven cases. We finished principal photography on five of them, and we have two more that we're shooting um, in October and November. Um, and um, we're releasing trailers that showcase each case. So far we have two trailers done, and we have three in the works for the other five we finished. Um, and now I'm thinking we have too much material. We overshot, so we might be repitching this to PBS stations as a, um, as a series, which is exciting. Yeah, because... um, so there's been a lot. Of, we, you know, PBS is lined up behind us. They're very excited to air this. Um, and what we have so far is pretty tremendous, in my humble opinion, because it's not only the Tim Cole case, uh, it details. It, it, Details, um, cases in California, Illinois, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, and um, uh, in the end, uh, when we release it, and we're shooting for late this year, although it might be early next year, um, we hope to also create kind of a, an online curriculum that goes with it, so it's useful for schools, universities, workplaces, etc., to um, utilize the production not just for uh, you know a journalistic visual, a documentary, but but for a learning type uh, uh, experience or, or um, you know add on to to the to the uh, entire production. So um, a lot of work, um, but we're um, really pleased with what we've we've accomplished. And um, unlike some of the projects you might see on television or other mediums about wrongful convictions, um, you know our focus isn't to sensationalize or dramatize anything. It's to actually leave the viewers with a takeaway, so you understand. Okay, now I, I understand Tim Cole is wrongfully convicted, but what were the reasons, what were the causes, and what's been done or should be done to um, alleviate those, those, those reasons and causes as we move forward to try to improve the criminal justice system? It's it's an interesting case, the Tim Cole case. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got, you've got um, the family. Now, the family, you said that he, he, were, he, he was, you know, got a pardon posthumously. Um, Texas is one of the states, I think, that does have a wrong, wrongful conviction compensation. Did they yeah, get anything? Yeah, one of the largest. Did the family receive any money? Um, they did. They they received. Um, I think it's. I I can't. Don't quote me for sure. Doesn't but it's, matter. it's yeah. like seventy nine thousand dollars a year for every year. Wow. Tim was wrongfully incarcerated, and then um, for people who were still alive, they 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 received that additionally um, um, until they die. But since Tim had died, his family received 
Um, you know, for every year he was in prison, I think it was like 12, 17. Again, I'm, I don't have my notes in front of me, but yeah. they received that money, sadly. I mean, you know. It is um, sad, but, you know, their son was taken from him. The whole life was right. taken from him. And it could have been their grandchildren was taken in all kinds of things. Now, the, the National Registry of Exoneration, I'm just going to read a couple of the stats that you had on your, your site. 1,832 men and women have been cleared of wrongful conviction in the last 25 years. 47% were black. 40% had been incarcerated for at least 10 years before their exoneration. Now, what was really sad in the Mark Cole case is that Jerry Wayne Johnson did repeatedly tell you know, officials, I did it. Mm-hmm. I did it. And he could have, Tim could have been out of jail, free man, if they had listened. But they didn't. Why didn't they? Well, that's a good question. You know, um, we we pushed and pushed for the the interviews we needed to answer those questions, and um, uh, we eventually did get interviews with the Lubbock Police Department and the prosecutor of the case, who really was resistant to talking about it. Uh, in fact, put me off for close to eight months. Um, wow. And finally, I was like, either either you're going to do the interview or I'm just going to say that for eight months you basically told me you wanted to but couldn't. And I'll let right. viewers decide whether you were, um, you know, trying to just avoid us completely or, or really had a legitimate reason. So he sat down to the interview and, and he, you know, again, a lot of, a lot of what they say is, uh, it was a miscommunication. Um, and, uh, um, you know, they, they went with the information that the police department gave them, whereas the police department says that, uh, they had given the, the, uh, the DA and the prosecutor, uh, additional information that uh, pointed to Jerry Wayne Johnson as opposed to Tim Cole. Um, You know, this happened in the 80s, so a lot Mm -hmm. of some of the people involved are dead. They're no no longer working in uh, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So you have to piece together as best you can. Um, You know, but I go back to the Innocence Project of Texas, which really helped clear Tim Cole. Um, And, you know, they point out the longstanding history of racial injustice and discrimination in the South. And, uh, you know, there is a good old boy now network, if you will, in Texas, according to some folks. Um, And if that is to be believed, you know, there are a lot of uh, people who think, well, you know, a black man committed this crime and um, we just got to get, we got to, yeah, we give, you know, and if we, (laughs) if, you know, if this black guy hadn't uh, been caught for this crime, he'd probably be caught for some other crime down the road. So, you know, we're just clear. Okay. Yeah, and again, nobody's saying that verbatim, um, no, but of that's not. kind of the, the the mood and the tone you get. And um, you know, uh, but finally, you know, we're coming to a point where people are being called out on this. Michelle Mallon, what did you think of her? We didn't actually Did interview Michelle. I talked to her on the phone repeatedly, uh, mm-hmm. but she, uh, I think, uh, you know, for a while after Tim Cole was cleared, and she realized that she had played a role in in getting him convicted by identifying him as her rapist and then learning later that she had been kind of uh, misled and persuaded by the police to to pin him you know she felt horrific about it she felt incredibly guilty uh so she was dealing not only with the repercussion of a rape but also this fact that she felt she was uh, compliant in the death of tim cole so i think mm-hmm. it took a real toll on her and she did speak for a lot of uh, a lot you know when this all came out um she did she did speak and appear uh, but I think now she's kind of backed away from the spotlight. She's just had enough. Um, and uh, so we are using only archival footage of her thoughts, um, which is fine. It's not the focal point of what we're doing, and, and right. we can convey her thoughts via that. But, um, you know, you, you, obviously, you know, if someone's been raped, uh, surviving that, uh, that is a lifelong ordeal to work through. Sure. And then you add in the guilt she felt over, you know, p- pinpointing the wrong guy. Um, but she was completely, she was completely uh, persuaded by police. You know, they use right. they use tactics that now are believed to be uh, uh, not only problematic, but, but but essentially immoral, unethical, and illegal in terms of how they portrayed. Um, the, they, they showed the photos of, uh, and the, how they, they did the lineup um, and how officers, you know, um, presented verbal and nonverbal cues to her while she was trying to identify the rapist. These are all issues that seem minute, kind of but they play too. a huge like role. If you don't do this right now, he's going to go out and rape somebody else, so you better do mm-hmm. it right now. And, mm-hmm. and coerced her into, uh, and, and of course her emotional state at the time was probably very fragile anyway. Yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah. That that was pretty crazy. Now, I'm sure you get a lot of calls. 
you know, you, you must screen a lot of calls. I, I know somebody, he's innocent. I swear to God, he's innocent. Can you come and help us? Yes, we so do. How does, <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you feel in your heart that, you know, okay, we can take this one on. Um, I think I believe them. Let's start looking for evidence. I mean, if you, if you, if you really uh, look for evidence in every single one, like you would never get any work done, I don't think. So how, how do you... Yeah, we wouldn't. And, you know, we're not a legal organization, so yeah. I can't I can't, in good conscience make those decisions. So the, the, all the cases that we're profiling in the documentary, they've been um, vetted, if you will, by some type of innocence project or a wrongful convictions unit um, in that particular state or area. So you have legal experts who've taken on the case who believe these folks and are doing what they can. They've either exonerated them or they're in the process of doing that um, because – then, um, you know, we focus on the journalism and not on the, the legality. Um, but, yeah, there's so many people. And even when I was a, a reporter for years and years in, in mainstream media, I mean, you get in letters all the time from inmates saying they're, they're innocent. And, you know, for years I just assumed they all were not because um, – you know, sure, 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 you're innocent. Um, but, we, you know, we do get a lot now, and I, unfortunately we can't include them all in the documentary. So what do I, I encourage people to do who, whose cases I do think have merit is to write either first-person accounts of their story or have or work with someone to write their story. Um, we did that recently with a woman who was accused of abusing kids in her daycare. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was a long, in-depth story about her ordeal with the, the um, justice system. And basically we investigate the other Side, we contacted the DA and the, the police to, to get their point of view, and they still believe she was guilty of abusing these kids. Um, I personally don't, which is why uh, we decided to, to, to work with her on her story. Um, and if anything, whether you believe her, she's innocent or not, you get a sense of what happens when one is accused in the criminal justice system, what to do and what not to do. Um, and I don't think most people who are truly innocent, who leave their, you know, leave, lead their lives day in and day out, thinking they're a, a good, upstanding citizen, ever would expect to be um, wrongly accused of a crime. Um, and it could. It can happen to anybody. It literally can. That's one thing I, I have learned in working on this project for the last year or so, is that it literally can happen to anyone. If you don't think it can happen to you, you're, you're sorely mistaken. Wow, it's pretty scary. It has to. It's a great fear of mine for some reason. You know, uh, in the injustice of injustice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, think, I think that's that's how I would describe it. It's it's true. Just, yeah. Makes me want to yeah. get so angry. But uh, we have another commercial break to go to. All it's right. Our last commercial break. Okay. But we will be right back with Mark Saxemeyer and the reporters with some more fascinating cases. Don't go anywhere. We will be back. Stop. That's right. Don't stop listening. Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso will continue right after these messages. Stop. It's Merging There are more cats in U.S. households than any other pet. Most allurophiles or cat owners know that unlike dogs, taking Kitty for a ride in the car isn't any fun. I mean, you never see a cat hanging its head out the window, enjoying the breeze. Today's domestic cat is descended from a small Mideastern wildcat. A group of kittens is called a kindle. And a group of adult cats is a clouder. What's the word for those dust balls composed entirely of cat hair? Fluffer nugans. Personally, I like pigs better than either cats or dogs. Dogs are subservient and look up to man. Cats are aloof and look down on man. A pig, however, will look you in the eye and see us equal. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert Annette Hammond. Have you ever considered dancing your way to fitness? It may be time for you to find innovative things to add to your fitness program. Variety is always good, not only for your body, but also for your mind. I want to encourage you to add aerobic dance to your exercise routine. Dancing has become so popular because of television shows like Dancing with the Stars. Aerobic dance classes get your heart rate up and sustains it while you work almost every muscle in your body. It allows you to let go and to release any stress that you're carrying while you get a fun and energetic workout. You don't need to be coordinated or a great dancer. Just step into a class or rent a DVD and let loose. 
Aerobic dance is a wonderful form of cardio exercise and a fun way to get in shape. I'm Annette Hammond. If you're a fan of Fitness Minute, like us on Facebook. And if you forgot where you were, you are listening to Mission Unstoppable Radio. My guest today is Mark Saxonmeyer, and I am your host, Frankie Picasso, and we are here every Tuesday at 1 Eastern Standard Time. Mark, that was a fascinating case that we were just talking about with Tim Cole. Uh, yeah. But there are others. There are others. And, and, you know, there's like you mentioned, the woman with the, with the daycare. There's another one, uh, another woman, you know, who, who was married and had two kids. And, and she was accused of, of, you know, something wrong. And uh, she went to jail, I think, 11 years. And her husband decided to divorce her. I mean, mm-hmm. lives are devastated. Lives are changed, ir- you know, irrevocably. Um, mm-hmm. And... and the average amount of time that people spend, you know, is 13.5 years. Like, that's crazy. Uh, before, you know, somebody says, hey, you're innocent. Oops. Wow. Yeah, it is crazy because, I mean, you know, if you've gone to prison for actually committing a crime, you know, and I haven't, but if you yeah. if you yeah. have, I'm assuming there might be something in your mind that says, okay, well, I did it and I deserve it. But if you're in prison and you... Um, no, you didn't do it. Um, the agony of that is uh, indescribable. And a lot of these folks who get out, they literally suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder mm-hmm. or some kind of anxiety or disorder because um, not only are they still, you know, dealing with, like, uh, uh, they can't sleep because when they were in prison they were always fearful they'd be attacked or um, a lot of them fear it's going to happen again. I mean, they jump when there's a knock at the door as if mm-hmm. somehow they're going to be dragged back to prison again because, yeah, you know, if it saying. happened once what, who's, and it was wrong, wrongful, and you were innocent, you've lost kind of um, – you've lost that sense most of us have that the world is right, that the world is just, that, you know, goodness will prevail and the system will, will protect us if, if something terrible like this happened to us. But if it doesn't, you know, you, you've really lost that foundation. And um, it's hard. It's very difficult for them to move it forward. It has to be. It has to be. How did the Queens come about? Now, I have to think, you know, Jazz Jennings has done a lot for trans, transgendered folks. I think, you know, she's that young girl, 15, and, and just been right out there and say, yeah, I'm transgendered. I'm a girl mm-hmm. inside and, you know, with boy parts, but I'm a girl. And, and people really come to, to kind of understand that it's not a choice that she made. It's who she was. She was born that way. And this this um, documentary, The Queens, is about some are transgendered, I guess. Some are still male. Some are – are they all dra- like drag queens? But how did you come to do this project? Who, how did well, in Chicago, about? there's a, a club called The Baton, and it's mm-hmm. been there since 1969, and it's probably the longest-running female impersonation show lounge in the nation. Um, there have been others, but they haven't lasted the test of time. And it was started by a man named Jim Flint, and he still owns it. And if you're in Chicago, um, a lot of people know about it. And, you know, it's, it, it, uh, it, it is um, an illusion like no other. And most of these performers, they're not drag queens, meaning they're not, they're not boys who dress up like girls and then live their lives to, as boys the rest of the time. These are transgender individuals who are um, somewhere between male and female. They have not uh, fully uh, transitioned um, for, the, for the sole reason that um, they're female impersonators. So as Jim, the owner of the club, says, you know, if you, if you're, if you fully uh, transitioned and you, as a transsexual, which is, you know, when you've had the operation, you've had the sex mm-hmm. change operation, the sex reassignment surgeries, um, you know, you're a woman. So these uh, performers um, all have the bottom half, if you will. Um, and Jim always says he checks. So what you're watching truly is um, um, uh, a female impersonator. A lot of them have had body enhancements and right. um, either take estrogen or um, have had uh, collagen injections on their hips and other places to become more feminine in appearance and they do literally live their lives as women Um, they do live their uh, lives as women they do yeah so 
so it's 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 kind of I would say it's a subculture of a subculture. Um, right. And so um, I um, had always you know gone to the show occasionally, taken friends. Um, and when I got out of TV news, I thought you know this is um, this is something we could expand upon um, as a documentary. And then. Then I said, well, we have to include Jim's other um, venture, which is he runs the longest-running female impersonation beauty pageant, and it's probably one of the most prestigious. And it's literally like Miss America. Um, It has all the competitions, and it's it's, – All the nationalities come. Yeah, well, it's held once a year in a huge venue in Chicago. Um, And uh, have you heard of the show RuPaul's Drag Race? Yeah, yeah. So a few years ago when RuPaul wanted to do that show, he tried to buy out Jim. He wanted to buy Jim's pageant and turn it into a show. And Jim is very proud of his own accomplishment, didn't want to, you know, it didn't matter how much money RuPaul was was offering, he uh, wanted to keep his own venture. So RuPaul went and developed RuPaul's Drag Race, which obviously has had a lot of impact on the culture. And um, Jim continues to run his event a little. It's far more obscure, but in the world of female transgender uh, competition, um, it's huge. And a lot of the contestants on uh, RuPaul's Drag Race have actually competed in Jim's pageants. So our now, take is again Jim, is, is Jim, you know, is Jim gay or straight or Jim's gay. Back in the okay. day, Jim's like seventy something now. But back in yeah. the day, he was a female impersonator, oh, uh, more okay. of a drag queen type, um, and um, he twirled a baton on roller skates. That's where the name, the baton, his club came ah, from. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, so what it is again? It, it's it's exploring the issue of of transgender, um, mm-hmm. but taking it into a very niche. Uh, yeah, area of 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 the sub of the culture. So um, you will explore all the issues um, that that you're seeing in mainstream media these days um, in terms of acceptance and whatnot. But also taking a look at why they're so driven to win this pageant that most people have never even heard of. I mean, this is yeah. like a huge goal for these uh, performers. Is there a school for them to put their makeup on? I mean, they're so distinctive. You know, no, you know, they learn it. from each other. You know, they, they all have yeah. drag moms and, and, and sisters and mothers. And, you know, it's a culture where, where um, it's all handed down um, from one generation to the next. Ah, oh, okay. So they're kind of adopted by, like, mothers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just really interesting. It's not... A culture I'm particularly familiar with. I'm a gay man, but I don't. I don't really, um, you know, live in that that world. So for me, it's still a constant um, um, kind of journey to understand further the mindset and how it happens, and and you know the struggles they go through because it's it's completely different than being gay. Well, it's different I mean, than it's, being gay because you're mm-hmm. trapped in a body. Of a, mm-hmm. of a sex yeah. that's not you. Yeah, and you're dealing with people who just think it's a freak show. You know, I mean, right. you have to, and and as a result of that, you develop a defense and a put up a wall because you have to, otherwise you'll be hurt all the time. So um, is the winner just based on clothing and looks? Is there any talent? No, no, there's talent. There's swimsuit, okay. there's talent, there's question and answer, there's interview. It's just like Miss America, except like far Miss more America. interesting. <laughs> if you watch on our on our website on the Queen's page, you, there's two trailers, and you you can see for yourself Great. just how elaborate um, the competition is. Um, it's oh, it's great. very cutthroat and very competitive, and you know um, I was always right. like, well, what if you? So what if you win? Nobody still nobody's going to have heard of you. But you know, in their world, they they travel around the world performing at um, different gay clubs, and um, they make a lot of money. Doesn't so, make a big deal out of these queens. Like, yeah, they're not mm-hmm. invited, or they are. What, say that again. Sorry. Like the Pride Day, or would would nobody like make a big deal out of them at a Pride event? Or um, yeah, kind of. But again, you have to be immersed in that subculture. Um, right. You know, I mean, you go to a Pride parade, like everybody goes for a different reason. I personally don't go to see transgender performers. It's not right. really high on my plate. But but if that is something you're interested in, yes. But again, it's still a sliver of society. Well, I guess what it is, is I mean. Transgendered is one thing, and theater is something else, and it is kind of transgender theater. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. There's a difference, I think, between somebody yeah. who is you know, trying to deal with their transgenderedness, let's say. Right. Well, again, these are, still, these are still men, technically. Right. Um, right. They may live their lives, but they still have, again, the, the genitalia that is uh, defining you as a man, because otherwise you would not be a female impersonator. That's, right. that's the and key so that here. That's the only reason that they're keeping their equipment 
And so they, right. can, they can make money. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, and, so, and, I mean, the, the joke is, I always say to Jim, really, you really check? I mean, come on, who's, yeah. who's, you're making somebody drop trow and check, but yeah. he, there have been, when there have questions have arisen about certain performers, you know, there are others who don't think it's fair. If, if someone has actually transitioned fully, they're not, they're, you know, they shouldn't be competing. Right. And that's, that seems fair. <laughs> you would think, yeah, yeah. But again, you know, uh, our our purpose of this is it's a spectacle and it's fascinating and it's colorful and it's interesting. Um, but you're also hopefully going to get to the psyche and the core of these individuals and and what what drives them in life. Do they have any other job other than the, other than doing what they do? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, the, the there's only so much money you can make performing at clubs. You know, some performers make. Um, uh, you know, a lot in tips or whatnot. And yeah. um, the cast at the Baton in Chicago is, is the full-time job. So, you know, it's one of the few venues where people have, a, you know, they do three shows a night, five, six nights a week. They have dressing rooms. Um, uh, but, you know, nobody's getting exceedingly wealthy out of it. But they're following their passion and their dream, and that's really what life is about. But, but so, when you win that um, big them, event, when you win that? the big event, when you win the big event, mm -hmm. what is the prize? Well, again, I, I, as I was saying, the, the 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 thing is, is that's what my one of my questions was. I mean, you're going to win this yeah. title, and then still no one's going to have heard of you, really. Is there, outside is there of, money? Is there money to it? Um, well, they get a small stipend, and uh, oh, I, I think okay. it varies every year on sponsors that might be involved. But the big the big deal is the title, and the title enables them to travel around the country. Um, not only promoting the pageant and all of that is expense, all expenses paid, but then they have this title, which which is supposedly a draw for the club owners who want to bring them in, and they'll pay them more because then they promote Miss Continent. Miss, Miss Continental 2016 will be here this weekend, right. and for those interested in that, you know, they they um, you know they'll they'll come out. It's like anything; it's just a notch in your belt. Because we only have two minutes, and I want to make sure that, that everything that you want to say to folks is going to be said. So, Mark Saxenmeyer, uh, what do you want to tell people? Well, I just, you know, again, if people are interested in what we do at the Reporters, Inc., I, I urge you to go to the website, um, uh, which is just thereporters.org. You can see um, the long-form, in-depth journalism we do, the, the written pieces, and you can find links to all the documentaries we're working on or have worked on. You can see trailers for, for them or clips. Um, you know, we also do video storytelling services for other nonprofits who have similar missions to ours. So we help people who um, are also championing, championing, hard word to say, social justice, by creating um, uh, messaging and marketing videos for them to tell their story. And 10% um, um, of, uh, of um, that fee goes to help us produce our documentary. So, uh -huh. um, you know, we, we try We're to... We're out of time. We, We're out of time. Okay. I'm so sorry. My apologies. Everybody, go to thereporters.org. It's a fascinating site. What The work that they're doing is profound. And thank you so much, Mark, for being my thank guest you, today. Frankie. Thank you, Frankie. I appreciate for listening. it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. <laughs> Take care, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. See you next they week. They didn't stop. Stories of people who, when the odds were against them, turn defeat into victory. You've been listening to Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso. See you next time, and always remember... Don't, 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 don't stop.